Thank you so much for being here. We're going to start right on time because we have many things we want to talk about. So let me start by introducing, introducing myself. My name is Pascaline Dupa. I'm the faculty director of the Stanford King Center on Global Development and also uh, the Klein Heinz Family Professor of International Studies over in the Economics Department. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Before we jump into the topic for the day, let me just say a few words about the King Center. Uh, our mission is to help improve the lives of people who live in poverty around the world, and we do this through uh, three main uh, channels. First, we support research, research that aims to inform policy and practice on quick critical development issues. Number two, we help train the next generation of thinkers and leaders in global development. And number three, we organize conversations such as this one today uh, on current issues uh, around poverty alleviation and development. So tonight, we are absolutely delighted to have Esther Duflo uh, as, as our guest. Uh, Professor Duflo is the recipient of the 2019 uh, Nobel Prize in Economics alongside Abhijit Banerjee and Michael Kramer for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. Esther is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics at MIT, and she co-directs uh, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, which she co-founded. Uh, our research has been uh, very influential in helping understand the economic lives of people living around, uh, in poverty around the world and in helping identify solutions um, in terms of improving access um, to, to health, education, financial inclusion, improving the environment or preventing its degradation uh, and improving governance. Beyond, uh, beyond our academic achievements and our impact on the world, Esther has also been a role model for many of us. Uh, for one, I've had the wonderful honor uh, and uh, privilege to be one of Esther's mentees for over 20 years now. Um, I've also had a chance to collaborate with her on a number of projects. So it's my very, very special honor uh, to welcome her here at Stanford today to speak to us about a topic that is of utmost importance. Indeed, the question which uh, is currently top of mind for many of us is the interaction between climate change and poverty. Uh, and that's what we're going to be uh, addressing today. Uh, Professor Duflo will discuss the disproportionate impact of climate change on people in poverty and why countries need to invest in policy innovation, not just technical innovation, to confront it. Now, uh, with extensive, I guess I forgot to move the slides. I'm supposed to move the slides. Okay, so, uh, all right, sorry. You, you, you'll see Esther uh, on stage, so I can uh, skip straight. Um, so uh, now, uh, with extensive experience in policy making, who better to moderate this event than uh, Arun Majumdar, uh, who is uh, the inaugural dean of the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the J. Precourt Provostial Chair Professor here at Stanford University, as well as the chair of the advisory board of the US Secretary of Energy. Uh, his current research uh, focuses on redox reactions and systems that are absolutely fundamental to a sustainable energy future. And we are very glad, uh, Arun, that you are here to moderate today. So thank you both for joining us. And without further ado, uh, let me welcome Professor Duflo to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, I am very, uh, very, very happy to, to be here. Uh, very happy uh, that uh, Kim and, that Kim and Bob and Doty uh, are here also. It's uh, particularly uh, uh, a great privilege to speak at the King Center in the presence of the kings themselves. Um, so we are uh, grateful for uh, the work of uh, we. It's a collective we, including Pascaline, uh, uh, the, the Stanford. Uh, University, but also us at, at JPL are very careful, uh, grateful for their support, and in particular for the, the, the support in trying to tackle these twin uh, challenges of poverty and climate change. And what I want to, to try to, the point I want to try to make today is how uh, the two uh, topics are extraordinarily related in that uh, it's the uh, climate change, the progress of climate change might, uh, in relatively short order, undo a lot of the gains that we have experienced in the fight against global poverty in the last few years. I'll try to explain some of that today. And also in the other direction in that I think it's going to be very difficult to really make a dent on a real uh, and sustainable solution 
and a fair solution to climate change without thinking about what it entails uh, for the poor. Uh, so let me start, basically I'll proceed in three, uh, three steps. The first one is to recognize that the responsibility of climate change is primarily uh, with the behavior of rich country citizens. Of course, we know that historically, and people are perfectly willing to recognize that it's the case historically. It's the path of development that was uh, un, you know, followed since the Industrial Revolution that has put so much uh, 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 CO2 in the atmosphere. But usually, after that, there is this next sentence yet. But today, today, of course, there is China, there is India, and there is, they are great contributors to the emission uh, that are responsible for climate change, which is true. But it is forgetting one thing important, which is a lot of the pollution that is being produced in China, a lot of the emissions that come in China, and actually in India as well, are emitted in the service of uh, the production of goods that are consumed uh, by uh, citizens all over the world, and in particular by citizens in rich countries. So uh, in other words, uh, uh, China produces a car, Maybe that's even a green, a clean car, but the car is then exported to California and it's being driven in California. So what we should really do to understand what is the real carbon, carbon footprint of every single person is not only uh, calculate how much uh, diesel they, or, or oil they use in their car, but also how much emission were produced in the service of producing that car. So of course, you cannot do it on a person by person for the whole world exactly, but you can estimate it. And this is something that Lucas Chancel uh, has done, combining very detailed data on inequality uh, around the world, uh, produced by the World Inequality Database in Paris, uh, with uh, uh, estimates of the elasticity of uh, emission of CO2 with respect to how rich you are. So in other words, the richer you are, the more you consume, the more you consume, the more your, your, the, the things that you consume require CO2, so we can calculate as a function of your place in the global income distribution how much you contribute uh, to your uh, to, uh, emissions. And when you do that, you have a very convenient, uh, easy to remember, 10-50 uh, rule, uh, which works in both directions, so it's very co convenient. The 10% highest polluters, that is the citizens uh, among you, if you rank all the citizens of the world from the highest polluters to the lowest polluters, the 10% at the top are responsible for about 50% of the emission. Conversely, the 50% lowest polluters are responsible for only 10% of the world emission. It didn't have to work that way, but it does, so that makes it convenient. We just have two, member, two numbers to remember, 10 and 50. That's the 10, 50 rules. Uh, and of course, the top 1% you know, uh, uh, polluter emit much more than per capita than anybody else below. So the, 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 the uh, inequality in, in pattern is, is stronger and stronger. What this means, and this is not work from Lucas Chancel, this is the parallel work that uh, estimates the individualized carbon footprint using different data and reach if, if, almost the same, uh, the same conclusion, is that uh, you can now take all of these, uh, each of these polluters and assign them to the country where they live, and you get this map, which is not going to surprise anybody, but the high polluters mainly live in rich countries. So that's the first part. Uh, uh, even when we take into account, not as a matter of history, but as a matter of today, uh, the emission responsible to climate change are mainly due to the behavior of the richer people in the world. Most of them are in our part of the world. What this means is that uh, if we, uh, in Africa, for example, is responsible for essentially none of the emissions in the world. That means that even if we manage to make everyone in Africa, or everyone in the world actually, to put them from below the poverty line to the poverty line, so in other words, if we achieved the eradication in extreme poverty that was hoped for for 2030, that would, that was, sorry, in, that would increase emission sorry, by only 2%. So basically nothing, it wouldn't register. You could take every poor person in the world and put them above the poverty line and the world would emit 2% more without any other change in how we consume and produce. So in other words, there shouldn't really be a, a, a trade-off uh, between 
uh, climate action and poverty because the climate action needs to take place in a rich country. Uh, and fighting poverty can, can happen anyways. That's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem, of course, is the cost. Uh, who bears the cost? And as much as the, uh, the burden of climate change, the responsibility of climate change rests on us, unfortunately, the cost uh, fall pretty much exclusively on people in poor countries. So of course, it's hard to tell you that when you're in California and you go from forest fire to inundation. And I'm not even sure it's very political because people here need to believe that it's a problem for them. But between us, it is good to keep in mind that the magnitude of the problem that we are going to experience in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, till 2100 are not are completely disproportional if we live in a poor area or in a rich area. Why is that? Well, the first part is that most poor countries are in places that are already hot today. That's unfortunate, but this is what it is. These are temperatures today, or heat map of heat temperature today. So, of course, the Sahel is already quite uh, hot. So is uh, 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 India, Pakistan, the northern part of Latin America. Now, that means that take any climate model and uh, uh, su superimpose it on this map. You're going to have more days that are above 35 degrees centigrade, or you know, it, which is really the, the type of days that become too hot for uh, human survival at a long, in the long run, or terrible for culture, and, and, and so on. So in the next 20 years, those countries will add, that are already hot, will add many more very hot days, and even, even more so by 2050. So this is the number of uh, uh, days above the, the, my heat mapping is a little bit not very stark, but you can see that you get many more addition of very hot day in Brazil, in India, uh, in the Sahel regions, etc. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that the cost of a very hot day in terms of, uh, uh, for example, the increase in mortality is not the same in a rich country and in a poor country. Because if you're in a rich country, well, a lot of people will work inside, uh, so they can work in air conditioned area. They are not as dependent on farming. Uh, they have air conditioning in their house, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, income consumption is actually protective against climate change. Uh, if uh, the, the Texas and uh, Punjab add the same number of very hot days above 100 degrees, many more people will die in Punjab. Almost nobody will die in Texas. So this is here an example of uh, comparing uh, Saudi Arabia to, uh, to Pakistan from work by uh, Michael Greenstone and others at the Epic Lab. And what they find is that the, the, this, these two places will have very similar number of very hot days. But in Pakistan, many more people will die. And in Saudi Arabia, almost nobody uh, will, will die, simply because they will, that's their estimate of how well they will be able to be protected by their environment. Overall, if you uh, combine this data, uh, you can see here on the map the extra mortality for every day above 35 degrees that this place would experience. And what you see is that in places where it's super cold, like in Russia, they're really not used to deal with hot. So if, if they get extra hot days, they would have many more deaths because of that. But they won't get them. So that will be fine. In places that are very poor, uh, like for example here in Africa, they will uh, suffer a lot from any extra day at 100 degrees because they are not very protected against that. Now, if you combine the two, the fact that there will be more hot days, and these hot days will be more costly, you get uh, this map, which is a heat map of mortality costs, which is the extra, um, the extra deaths that are imputable to climate change. This is, again, this type of maps also come from Michael Grinson's work. And you can see that it's where you're going to, the blue zones are zones that are going to benefit. So the north of North America, Canada, Boston probably, are going to benefit from climate change because we won't be too cold in the winter. Uh, the Sahel region of Africa, the north of South Asia, will suffer. By the time of 2100, uh, in terms of extra death, you can see a big red blob in Africa. Uh, uh, the, the, the US is mostly blue, uh, not really benefiting. And then, of course, there is you know, substantial uh, uncertainty around this estimate, which is uh, 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 
captured by this, by this distribution here. But the point is really the color of the maps, which is that where are the costs? The costs are mainly in the poorest place in the world. So that makes, and how big are these costs? So according to, uh, 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 to the work uh, uh, of the Global Impact Lab, if we combine the, the cost that we can estimate from past variation in, in temperature to the future uh, climate model, we, we can anticipate just from temperature alone an increase of about 73 lives per 100,000 uh, if we go with a high emission scenario. To put this in perspective, that's as much as all of the infectious design combined today. So it's more than malaria, uh, HIV, uh, tuberculosis combined. It's less than heart disease. Moreover, two other points important to note here. It wouldn't take that much to bring it basically to zero. So basically, under the moderate emission scenario, it would go to uh, almost zero. And finally, this cost, if we attribute them to each country, where we will find these countries, they are entirely due to extra deaths in the poor countries. In fact, in the OECD on net, this is going to be mildly, mildly positive. Of course, uh, temperature is not the only problem that is with climate change. We, we, we can expect coastal damage and, and, and you know, other catastrophes that I want to, don't want to talk about. But just a temperature example makes the point. We have a problem that is due to the behavior in the rich countries, of the rich country citizen, that is going to affect primarily people in the poor countries. So the conclusion, unfortunately, is this makes it from a political problem from hell because there really is no reason for us to be really committed to this problem, which really doesn't affect us. And we haven't been, we haven't shown as a collective we of the rich world great uh, capacity uh, for empathy or even solidarity when we had, uh, when we face a crisis. If you take the COVID-19 crisis, in some sense, it's a good rehearsal for climate change crisis because it's a global problem. Uh, it's certainly not the fault of the poor countries. It affected everyone at once. And it was not even that hard. Basically, there are two things we could have done for, to help the, rich, the poor countries immediately. One is make sure that there was a flow of funds that would help them spend about the same amount of money corresponding to their GDP that we were spending on ourselves. So the rich countries spend about 27% of their portfolio in uh, uh, fiscal stimulus measures. Uh, that's fine. This, sorry, not 27% of their GDP in fiscal stimulus measures. The poor countries spend 2% of their GDP in fiscal stimulus measures. And of course, the GDP of the poor countries is much smaller. So it's 2% of a much smaller GDP. It would not even have registered in how many trillions we were borrowing, we being the US or Europe, to bring them up to the, to the level of 27% of GDP. It just would have, been, would have been rounding error, and yet nothing like that happened. The, the increase in international financing flow were not zero, but pretty much negligible in relationship to what was spent in the rich countries. So money-wise, we were not very good uh, in, in front of pressure. The second example, of course, is, is vaccination. Countries came together, created COVAX, and then immediately proceeded to hoard all the vaccines, so COVAX had nothing to buy. So what this means is that, I think what this taught me is that we really, as a world, not very good for multi multi multilateral action in face of a crisis, so we better get organized now before we are so in the crisis uh, uh, to uh, uh, organize joint world action to deal with this issue that there is nothing the developing countries can do to address this problem, but yet they are the ones who need to suffer from it. So we need to think about it now. So where are we today? A somewhat unfair characterization. Uh, but the first part of it is there is not enough money flowing towards low and middle income country. Uh, the commitments are too weak. Uh, they, they, they are, even if they are too weak, they are not renewed anyways. They are not carried out. Uh, so Basically, since Copenhagen, it's been disappointing after disappointing. The COP27 created a fund, great, loss and damage fund, but there's no mechanism to put any money in it. So now that there is a fund, I think it's a good time to think about uh, how much money to put on it. Uh, 
Another place of where we are is, in, in my opinion, there is too much reliance on technological solutions and too much reliance on win-win solutions and not on the necessity for us to change how we behave. Like, we not only need to cons you know, drive cleaner cars, we actually need to drive less cars. Uh, there is a huge attraction for win-win. It's very human. Uh, so this desire to find the technology that is going to take us out of this problem. Uh, but uh, randomized experiments that were concluded trying some of these technological solutions are pretty disappointing. So, for example, there is uh, there was a, uh, during the Obama era did a, a work done on weatherization of on home of homes, uh, which you know with a nice very big experiment uh, which showed zero uh, very not zero but close to zero impact of weatherization of homes on energy consumption. Certainly not enough to. <laughs> Uh, uh, to make a dent in the problem. Similarly, work by Nick Ryan looks at energy consulting in India, trying to help farms in India reap the uh, uh, low-hanging fruit of spending less on energy. The farms did spend a save a bit of money on energy, but then they immediately turned around and produced more, such that ultimately they actually emitted more, not less. Uh, so we can't uh, uh, rely on technological change alone. Uh, on the other hand, there is actually good news on what we can do to change behavior, again, from randomized experiments where people, for example, who receive uh, reports on how much they consume are willing to, to consume a little less. The second point I want to make is that we cannot tackle climate change without tackling redistribution across countries. Because of this fundamental unfairness uh, of, of the process, no adaptation fund will mean less mitigation. Why? In the absence of fund for adaptation, becoming richer as fast as possible is the best protection. So this is exactly the position of India in climate negotiation. They're like, you're very nice, but I'm not going to run out, to go out of coal unless you, you know, unless you can, I have, I can have commitment that I can protect my citizens against the warming that is happening. In the meantime, we need coal because we need air conditioning for all of this. So the lack of uh, adaptation funds is also uh, 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 ensuring that there is not the mitigation we need. We cannot tackle climate change without tackling redistribution within countries. And that is because this is a picture from France where uh, uh, there was a, a short-lived effort to impose a, a, a current tax that uh, uh, led to massive protest. Uh, what this T-shirt says is money for climate change is in fiscal paradise, not in the pocket of the proletariat. And the idea is that the incidence of a climate of a carbon tax goes mainly to the, to the, on the poor, uh, and that uh, uh, this is not, this, there's no reason for the poor of France to finance uh, uh, either, you know, there is no political will to, for the poor of France to finance the poor of the world. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And there is certainly no, uh, no uh, uh, desire for the poor of France to uh, compensate for what they perceive to be the misbehavior of the rich people of France. Similarly, in, in, in India, uh, uh, there is a, a tremendous overuse of electricity, which leads to overuse of water as well. Uh, so, uh, government after government tries to uh, solve this problem by asking people to pay a little bit for power and in exchange, uh, give them kind of a, a lump sum to compensate them. And government against government fails uh, in this operation because they are not trusted that this redistribution will actually take place. So here is, in one uh, slide, a, a blueprint for a serious commitment to funding for low- and middle-income countries that takes these two things into account. Uh, well, promises are not sufficient. We need a, a commitment to a mechanism that is going to, year after year, very regularly, raise uh, money to be spent in the poor countries. Since the contribution to the problem is intimately linked to inequality, then also the solution might be linked to inequality. So a, a possible uh, solution would be to have minimum taxation of either wealthy individuals or corporations. I highlighted corporation because I don't think wealthy individual is a very uh, feasible plan at the world level. But corporations, we're really not very far because there is already an international negotiation for minimal taxation of corporations. So it would be within the realm of possibility to add a percent to the taxation of corporations to create a fund that would then be allocated specifically to poor countries. 
So I don't like to make crazy plans, and I don't think this is a crazy plan. I don't think this is an unfeasible plan in the sense that this kind of need to be tacked on on, an, on a discussion that's already there. That doesn't mean it's easy. The last aspect of it, and that's you will recognize my, uh, where I come from, is an open-minded approach to find out what works. I think the quick discussion on the shortcoming of the engineering dream is that there is really no silver bullet. I think the full decarbonization of rich economy will be difficult at current level of consumption. We need to learn to con consume less, and also we need to learn very quickly how the poor countries can adapt so that we avoid the 73 uh, extra death. And we don't know very much. The evidence on climate is still emerging. So here is uh, how uh, we at, at KKI, the King Climate Action Initiative, are trying to kind of uh, put some, shed some light on, in a sense, all part of this debate. Uh, it's through four pillars. We are trying to gather evidence, accumulate evidence, really as fast as possible, on what works for mitigation, adaptation, co-pollutant. Uh, so this is the energy that, uh, the, and the way of generating energy, not only create climate change in the future, but create pollution that kills today, and energy access. And all of these things needs to be combined if we want to have a chance to mitigate climate change in the poorer countries and help people adapt to it quickly. I'll briefly highlight, uh, for example, one in each uh, domain. One is mitigation. So that's the idea, very common, very popular, of uh, payment for environmental services. There are a lot of forests in developing countries. Uh, the forest is there. Uh, you could pay people to conserve it. There is a lot of climate uh, or carbon credit that are actually uh, paying for that. Not that much evidence whether they work or not. But here, a great study uh, by uh, Sima Jayachandra, it's a randomized control trial in, in Uganda, uh, which pays owner of farms, of, of land, to not uh, cut out the trees that are already there. And she, found, she finds uh, um, uh, an increase, a tree cover increased by four, uh, decline by 4% in treatment villages compared to 9% in control, so you avoid 5%, uh, without displacement to deforestation on other lands. It's a very, uh, very cheap way to achieve mitigation. Another example on the co-pollutant and also innovation is work by uh, Nick Ryan, Michael Grinson, Roy Nipande, are uh, looking at a, a groundbreaking emission trading scheme in, uh, in Surat, in Gujarat, one of the uh, most polluted places on Earth. This is actually a pilot because it's not CO2. This is, uh, this is uh, emission of uh, suspended particulate matter. So this is really the this tiny, tiny particle that will um, make you choke. Uh, but they worked with the government to set up a whole market for farm to exchange permits of pollution. And that led to a 20 to 30 percent reduction in affected plants at very, very little cost. Because it turned out that some farms have a lot of excess capacity for cleaning that they were not using. So uh, absolutely a, a wonderful, very, very important project that's now been scaled up and adapted in other states and can be a model not just for the developing world, but actually also for the developed world about how to make emission markets work. Example for adaptation is uh, rainwater harvesting. So in places that are already severely degraded, for example, the Sahel region in Africa, it's possible to, put, to we have to find new ways to, to put back a degraded soil into operation. Here is an example work by uh, Kelsey Jack and Jenny Acker looking at this called, in French, it's called demi-lune, so or half moons. So the idea is really simple. It's really a lot of labor, but you are putting a, a half moon in order to collect the rainwater, which allows to uh, put back the moisture every time it rains. The moisture is maximized and go back into the soil, which allows people to restart uh, growing in places that were uh, uh, considered to be uh, kind of done for. Uh, here, training was sufficient to lead to an increase of 95% uh, in, in take-up. Uh, with a crop income increase of 12 to 14%. So I gave you mostly examples where we had positive results. There are also examples which I cited along the way where it's not as positive. It's always a combination of the two. But the point is that there is so much to learn, and there is so much that once we learn, we can scale up and, and adapt. So if we go back to the fund that I was uh, calling for, that fund can be in part used to immediately compensate people who who need help, for example, because of flood or drought, 
but also go into innovating the, the, the strategies that are going to take us out of this uh, quagmire, hopefully, and, uh, and not undo the gain in poverty. Uh, so in conclusion, the COP27 has opened a huge uh, window of opportunity, uh, which is this fund. Uh, we now need a lot of people uh, to come together um, to try and see whether this can be combined with a robust uh, funding mechanism. And this is going to be a, co a combination of really all the political goodwill we could find, uh, uh, combined with a lot of creativity and ingenuity in using this, this fund. Thank you so much. Well, Esther, that was absolutely wonderful to, you know, for us to learn your connection that you're making between the inequality in this world and climate change. And the, the, thesis, the thesis that you have is that you've got to address the inequality to address climate change. And you laid out some of the disparities in, in clear fashion. And... Um, there are so many questions out here because this is a, it's a rewiring of our brain to even think that way. And just to, for everyone's sake, I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to ask you these questions, but it's, it's, it's something that I think is there in everyone's mind. And we will open it up for questions in about 15 minutes, so be ready with your hand up and your questions ready. So if I just listen to you and just step back, there are few major problems, and I will just reiterate what you just said. One is that we got to decarbonize the developed citizens, in the, or citizens who are wealthy, uh, the top 10%. We got to decarbonize, help them decarbonize, and you also said consume less, and I'm going to come to that. The second is that that's the decarbonization part. The second part is how do you help nations which are, and regions which are in the low income level, adapt to climate change? Because while we like to hear that you know, we'll keep it below 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees, um, there's a risk out here that we can exceed, right? And then there's, for the adaptation and for the development to address the poverty, there needs to be a, a transfer of wealth to, the, uh, to, the, to those countries. And the question is, do we have the mechanism? That kind of is kind of the broader, the higher level messages. So let me start with this. And you know, when you started off with the 35 degrees Celsius, it reminded me of a book I started reading um, called The Ministry for the Future. How many of you have read the book, Ministry for the Future? If you have not, I would strongly recommend you do that. It, I had the occasion to interview like this, the, uh, the author, Kim Stanley Robinson. And the book starts with a, an event of wet bulb temperature exceeding 35 degrees in Uttar Pradesh, in India and 20 million people die because humans cannot survive wet bulb temperature beyond uh, 35 degrees Celsius. And that kind of pushed us in my research group to look at what are the predictions like and what happens between 30 and 35. It's really bad also. It's, and if you don't have air conditioning, you're in trouble. So given all of that, are we doing enough from the developed countries on the first problem to decarbonize fast enough, and when are we, you know, how, are we failing? Are we, are we on pace with the change of climate change? And what needs to be done right away? You asked for a call to action. What is the call to action for the developed regions and countries? Well, I'm not a really a specialist of the richer countries, so I don't know if I'm the person to answer that. You tell me, but uh, no, <laughs> it is like that seems pretty clear. I don't know, it seems to be a, I hope it was a softball in that, <laughs> No, I mean, this, it is clearly no sense of, uh, I mean, the, yeah, there is no sense of the urgency uh, that, uh, of, of, the, of the change that are needed in the rich countries. And as I explained, most of the, solu the, the decarbonation part has to happen essentially in the rich countries. That doesn't mean the poor countries don't have a role to play because, for example, there are forests that could stay there. Uh, instead of burning, which would make a big difference. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia is burning uh, uh, peat forest to, to, to put, uh, to put um, a palm oil. But then who eats the palm oil? We eat the palm oil. 
So eventually, it, even what is happening in, in poor countries as a con as a, is a connection to uh, to us. Uh, so it is clear that uh, we are not doing enough in in rich countries. But the question is then for all of us is like how do we do that? And people who are coming more from an engineering background will say, well, we have to improve the engineering. We have to, and that's certainly a part of it. Have to change the technology, move to renewable. Um, uh, become more energy efficient. Uh, the social scientist in me wants to say, well, there is also a lot you could do on the behavior. The European carbon footprint, a European carbon footprint conditioning on where you are in the income distribution is so much lower than the carbon footprint in an American. And we are not, uh, Europeans are not sadder as a result. So I think there is a lot in our consumption behavior that is a matter of habit. So we, and it's a matter of social norms. So we think it's, you know, since our neighbors have big cars, we also should have big cars. And since we have uh, two big cars, if one of them breaks down, we think we should kind of replace it. Uh, so there is this kind of post-social norm and the habit without necessarily a clear sense of whether that produces happiness. I think people are very unclear about what makes them happy and don't have a good sense of what is important in, in, in their life. So actually, even though I'm a sort of techno-pessimist, I'm actually a behavior optimist in the sense that I don't think it's that hard to push people around. You take Paris, nobody used to cycle. And now everyone cycles. And it really took, you know, it took one strike where the subway was not working anymore. So, and then, you know, some investment in cycle line, but not even, it has completely changed the, the place. And now it's in place. So I think there is a lot that can be done to change behavior. And in, in this country, from my perspective, the discussion is not enough about that and too much about we have to keep the exact same lifestyle and then power it cleanly. So let's go to the consumption side. I completely agree with you. If you look at just the consumption data, it has, it's a super exponential um, per capita also. And if you add the population growth, it's just ultra super ex exponential. So what policies would you introduce to reduce consumption when the metric of success in a country, let's say, is GDP? And that's GDP production, but people, people are producing because someone is consuming. So are there metrics of success? Are there economic policies to improve a different metric of success to reduce consumption? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think historically, for, at least for decades, I don't know exactly since when, but it started, you know, maybe at the Industrial Revolution, maybe, maybe Simon with Kuznets, the war. actually, MIT. The, the, the metric of, of the leagues of, the scores, the scores in the leagues of nations were, were expressed in terms of your GDP. And that's true both in rich countries and in poor countries. And a lot of... Uh, wrong decisions were taken in the feeding of that particular monster. Uh, for, so I think it's a monster for two reasons. The first one is we don't eat GDP. It's not very important. What should be important is like people, so in developing countries it's simple. If people, or here, there was an article in the New York Times two days ago about child mortality. Uh, it's much, much, much more important the lifespan that people have, how many years they can have happy, they can have healthy lives. That should be much more important than GDP, and GDP should be seen to be a mean to arrive to that uh, end. And by getting focused on GDP, we forgot that. I don't mean to say that GDP is, we should not at all be concerned about GDP. In poor countries, poor countries need to grow. Because there is no way to reduce poverty in very, very poor countries in Africa unless they produce, unless the, the, the GDP expands. But as we saw, that will contribute zero to climate change. So it's not, I'm not saying that one should not consider GDP at all, but it's a, it's a means to an end, and the end is really quality of life. And when we see in a country like the US that our children die, we should think, well, we better do something about that and before GDP, first of all. Second thing is, we, don't, we have no idea how to affect growth anyways. It's not something that, and when I say we, it's not, certainly not me, but nobody knows. Like, microeconomists have long given up on giving us a recipe for 
growth. We know what not to do, so you know how to really screw up your economy. Uh, but once you avoid that, we just don't know anymore. And there is a country like Bangladesh that goes from super high growth to low growth to high growth to low growth with no clear sense that they did anything very different. On the other hand, we have very good tools to improve this very direct measure of welfare that we should really care about, which is health and mental health and going to school and women being able to have a job and you name your list. And not, there are many things we already know, and there are many things we know how to know because these are very well-defined problems for which we can, uh, we can you know, design experiments if we don't already have the answer. So by defocusing on growth, so I don't, uh, I don't even want to say we have to do degrowth. So we have to stop thinking about growth per se and come back to what it is we care about, which is human life. And then we can make progress both in rich countries and in poor countries. So is Human Development Index a better measure? And uh, we don't should... need to, in my opinion, we don't need to index it. Okay. We can just, because indexing it, I think it's us, we are talking to each other. Uh, <laughs> indexing it makes it, um, uh, obscures it. I think it's, you know, we are smart enough that we can keep yeah. 10 dimensions in our head at the same time, and uh, we should. Uh, so, and then we can, then that can help us also think, okay, where is it that we need to act? So let me switch the subject to adaptation, because I, I couldn't agree more with you that we are in an all-hands-on-deck situation right now, and you gave such an amazing example of lessons learned from COVID where we did not do a good job. But the adaptation side, I mean, if let's look at India for that matter, since you raised... Uh, Gujarat and, and Punjab and others, and if we have a, a extreme weather event, a heat wave and a humidity wave, the co combination is really bad, is, is the country prepared or other regions prepared? And if not, how do you incentivize proactive measures for adaptations? Because that doesn't pay off. The return on investment cannot be counted right away because you don't know when it's going to hit you. Um, so there are two ways to, to think about this problem, at least. One of them is, uh, in some sense, the, the structural changes in, in what people do with their lives. Uh, so, for example, the Niger example is that, which is how do we, how do we uh, produce in lands that is degraded and where it's generally warmer. Uh, and then, and there I think we, we have very little, uh, we have way, way, way too little evidence. We need to really push, do much more work on adaptation. To the extent there has been money for climate change in developing countries, mostly gone to mitigation, because we mean that helps us too, and not so much to adaptation. So not as enough is known. At, you know, at KKI, we do uh, try and, 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 and support research that is about you know, adapting to a permanent changing reality. Then there is a second, second part to ask is, oh, what do we do when there is a catastrophe? And are we prepared for a catastrophe? And I think we are not, but we know a bit better uh, about how we could be. Uh, and there, COVID was particularly uh, was useful, and we also have learned over, over time much more about you know, how to structure social protection and how to structure a social protection system that is ready for people uh, to, um, uh, who are facing a, a, a large crisis to avoid. So basically what you want to avoid is to avoid plunging them into a poverty trap that will take a very long time for them to go out. So going back to the COVID example, the, the great success, really the huge success of, of both the U.S. and Europe is that the money that was spent allowed people, avoided people jumping into poverty trap. And the moment the economy could restart, the economy was ready to hump. It was good for equity, and it was also good to get the economy in place quickly. Now, what happened in the poor countries is that, as I said, no money was available. The people could not borrow to uh, finance more social protection. So mostly, they didn't have uh, uh, help. For example, in India, it was very patchy whether or not people got financial help during COVID. Some African countries managed to have programs like Togo, for example. Others did not. 
on balance, the result is that when uh, the, the economy is reopened, the rich economies restarted very quickly, and the poor didn't. And today, the, the prediction of the IMF for, for the low-income country is negative growth coming forward in 2023. Now, of course, this, then there was the Ukraine crisis and the increase in uh, food prices and so on, which doesn't help. But it's also, I think, the fact that a lot of people were jumped, dumped into, uh, into poverty traps, and then that creates this sort of doom loops where uh, they are in poverty traps, so the local economy gets de deflected, and then, the, uh, and then it's harder to restart. All that to say that if we want, we actually, I think we have a good idea of what, needs, what we need to do to be prepared for a catastrophic event like a, a drought where places need to meet. We need to find a way to have money in the hands of people very quickly. And in, in many countries, most countries in Africa, for example, are almost ready to have that in the sense that there is electronic, the people have money on their phones, people have electronic wallets. It wouldn't take much to have basically a pipeline ready uh, that would make it possible to act quickly to get money directly into the people in case of a, of a local, localized climate disaster, which would allow the doom loop thing. Uh, so, which would sorry avoid the doom loop uh, doom loop thing. So, so go back to my fund that I would like. I'm calling for uh, for uh, for creating one use of this fund could be in advance of the crisis, invest in the pipeline, the, 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 the infrastructure, so that everyone is connected to a spigot that can bring money to them when needed. I think this is within our reach. It's a lot of work, but you know, organizations like Give Directly, for example, have done tremendous efforts. Governments are ready in a lot of places. Uh, in Togo, the government managed to put their COVID, their COVID thing done in three weeks. It was just amazing. So we are... I think we could make that happen. And then these funds would have money to actually put <laughs> in the pipeline when it's needed quickly without having to negotiate for a few months about whether the special drawing rights can be moved from rich country to poor country and at what cost and do we really want to do it and, and so on and so forth. It should really be automatic. You take again Togo, they put in place their system for COVID help in a, in a few weeks and then they didn't have any money. So you say something very fascinating out here is that in those parts of the world where, where uh, you know, it's low income and the, and, and the infrastructure is not there to adapt to climate change, but they are the same place that we have digital finance yeah, and the, digital payments. And so use that as a, as a platform for that one, so the tax that you're going to put to the corporation, whatever the number is, that's going to lead to, you know, several hundred billions or a trillion dollars per year. And if that goes, that's the mechanism to pay. Yeah. But would that really, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is my last question. I'm going to open it up for, would, how, I mean, how should one think about a large chunk of money going to those low-income regions in the world and having them adapt? Did, does, that need, does that need a governance structure to leverage the money properly, to create warehouses with air conditioning in case the, or, or or for water or other adaptation measures? Yeah, so that's the part of the plan where I need to do some of my homework. <laughs> but uh, so you think of it as this, uh, uh, this pot of money could cover part of it. So I think there is always the, there is a bit of tension between, oh, should the money go to poor countries for them to do whatever they want with it? Because after all, it's their compensation for the evil we inflict to them. Versus should it be run in a multi multilateral way with a chance that maybe it's run better? So I think that this idea of uh, uh, getting people within reach of a direct transfer whenever there is a, um, a warning that there is a drought uh, is a sweet spot for part of the money because then the money goes straight to people and goes straight to people who need it. And uh, I'm not saying it's without any governance problem, but it helps. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's transparent, people understand what they, are, what they are entitled to, and it solves the problem that in, today insurance markets are supposed to do that, but they, they just do it very, very poorly. So it's kind of weird, it's the world coming to 
help in creating that insurance mechanism for there. So that's kind of some part of the money can be used to that. Uh, some part of the money needs to be used for uh, um, innovating, and I think this part needs to be mutualized, and but needs to be mutualized in a way that is uh, very open for people to uh, from every region of the world to to apply. If you take the example of uh, development impact venture at USAID or FID in uh, in in France, uh, Fund for Innovation and Development. This, are, this is money of US money or French money, so the governance is, is, is French or, U, or American, but the, the application process for the money is super open. And anybody, anybody can go, and it's, you don't need to, you know, the, 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 the application process is very smooth, and people get, uh, their, their proposal gets handled quickly, and you can apply for just a little bit of money for ideating something that's. Uh, um, you know, needs fifteen thousand dollars for, or you can imply for millions of money for helping scale up uh, an effective solution. And I think big part of that money could be used in this way, which is again, it's not, um, it's not uh, run by every country, but it's also not run by a vast bureaucracy that already had a, has a lot of opinion about what should be done. It's run in the way that uh, uh, you know we're. You know, we, we run big, uh, big parts of JPL, for example, or KK, or, or the, the, the King Center here, which is like people apply, present their project, evaluate, many things will not work. Some will work, and there will be the solution of tomorrow. Fantastic. OK, let's see. Just by a show of hands, how many people have questions? There are quite a few. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to group a few questions. So let's start from the left, and we'll go randomly. Whoever has questions, just say uh, in, on the mic, just tell your question. Where's the mic? Um, if you could just give two or three people the mic, and let's hear them questions and group them, and then we'll go to the next group. OK, quickly. State your question quickly. Hi. Um... I guess my question is: There a lot of low-hanging fruit in the world of poverty, whether it's in agriculture, education, etc. Where do you see the direction in this field going, and like the biggest things we should be tackling in the next decade? Low-hanging fruit and poverty. Okay, you had a question out here. Next question. Um, so, my question is that you talked about consumption being reduced, and we did hear about the individual consumption being reduced, but Consumption is a product of the number of people on this planet and the per person consumption. So do you have any take on the population as a whole being reduced or where Absolutely. should it be reduced and how and et cetera? Great question. How do you reduce consumption too? And then the third one, and then we'll, we're going to get to answers. Yeah. So question on changing Americans' behaviors, which reminded me of something Jimmy Carter said in the 1970s during the energy crisis in which he made a speech that similarly criticized American materialism and encouraged us to adopt energy-friendly habits. But Carter's speech was more of a prescription rather than an actual policy proposal. And I'm wondering, beyond any moral or philosophical arguments, are there any formal mechanisms through which we can incentivize Americans to adopt more climate-friendly habits? Thank you. Fantastic. So again, the same behavior consumption as well as uh, the low-hanging fruit. Let's, let's get to your answer. A low-hanging fruit? Oh, I, I don't know. If I knew, I would, <laughs> I would <laughs> pick them. Uh, I, 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 I think the, the, I, I think they probably are. We just need to figure out where they are. And so uh, the, the key is to not be looking for. It's fine to look for low-hanging fruit, but we shouldn't be looking for silver bullets. And I think that's a little bit, that's, it used to be a problem in, pover, in the poverty field where people were really attracted by this one solution that was going to solve the entire problem and the one solution changed over time. And I think we've, got, we've moved away from that quite effectively where people now understand that the problem of poverty has many aspects and in a sense they're all important and they can be addressed with different people with different talent and needs and desires and, and make progress in all of these things. In, in the climate field, I think we are a little bit too uh, at the, at the, for the hunt of the, of the magic bullet and not realizing that it's going to be a combination of, of, of many things. 
on the consumption population, issue. Yeah. Population decrease, maybe one of these magic bullets. You know, the, the world population is actually not increasing as fast as what's predicted even recently. Uh, so uh, fertility is really uh, collapsing in, in, in many countries. Uh, in some countries, this is actually the problem <laughs> uh, of the future, like it is, uh, for example, in, in, in China. Uh, but in, in, in basically the world at large, there are very, very few places where, where we can think that population is a source of massive uh, uh, climate problem. It's really not the problem of the number of bodies. It's the problem that 1% of the bodies are really, really emitting way too much uh, energy, which gives me back to this uh, Carter speech. I don't think it did any good for its political fortune. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased I don't have any because, uh, uh, but he was right. Now, uh, there are many ways to get at that. Uh, one way, uh, which again would not do an, any good for my political fortune, would be to, have a, to go back to a more progressive uh, taxation system, which we used to have in the US until uh, uh, not so long ago. Uh, including under uh, uh, Republican administration, where the top tax rates used to be quite high. And then if you don't have too much money that is available for you to consume, then you are going to consume less. And the, uh, But we've, we've moved away from these very high uh, marginal tax rates to very top, uh, on very top incomes. And I don't know if there is a return to that anytime, anytime soon. With that said, then it's not uh, going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's in the US, in a country like the US, I think it's, it is probably going to, more likely to work through regulation, so qu really quantity, like uh, limitation of what people can do. Or, in French, we are talking about limiting people. It, is, it seems in, an, anecdotal, but ultimately it accumulates. It's, you know, people shouldn't take uh, flights when they can uh, take the train for less than three hours. And this is, I, this is something which maybe two, three years ago would have seemed like impossible to adapt, and now it's pretty accepted. Uh, um, heavy taxation on, uh, on uh, aviation fuel, in particular what's being used in private jets. Um, that, you know, little thing by thing, thing by thing by thing, affecting, like reaching the very, very top uh, would already be a, a good start. And then for Americans, they also need infrastructure. I mean, in a sense, America is unlucky by being so dispersed. We were talking earlier about uh, train infrastructure in California, and that seems to be a complicated political problem, but it's probably one that would need to be, to be addressed. We're running out of time, but if, if I could, oh, all right. <laughs> let's come to the middle, and let's, let's, favor some students out here. There's a student over there, there's a student out here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question is that, um, is there a level of agency in regards to climate action in the poor countries? In that, do the people in the poor countries realize that actually climate change is happening and why it's happening? Because in my opinion, I feel like that has not really happened and there's less education of why it's happening and actually why it's, why it's happening and where is it coming from. And in that way, you find that the Western is the one that pushes more for climate action, but the people in the poor countries not really know what is happening in terms of the literacy in regards to climate action. There's another student out here. I remember this article a few years ago that explained that um, around 70% of um, carbon emissions was caused by corporations. So in these spaces where we talk about climate change, we often talk about individuals, but have you considered that in this effort of decarbonizing, like what are some approaches that government could take to target climate change focused on corporations instead of citizens? And would you say that this would be more effective? And there's a last question. Go ahead. Quick question. Quick question. Okay. Uh, you talked a lot about the poverty in the world. 
the 7 billion people in the emerging markets produced in 2000, 20% of the global domestic product. By 2020, in that area, or close to today, they produce 35%. This is mainly due to China, but China was the first one out of the basement. And I think that you're underestimating the power of those people in the 7 billion area. And of them improving their condition. Is it a question or a comment? It is a question. The second question is quickly. why no mention of nuclear? <laughs> of nuclear. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm an old student. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What, what, what was and the question? What's, why no mention of nuclear? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, uh, let me start with the, the corporation. So, I, as I said, um, my, actually, my, my, my little policy proposal involves the taxation on corporation. Uh, so, I suppose uh, they are part of the uh, of the they are part of the of the landscape for me. And you know, one extra degree that you could do. So, and and when I answered her question, I said like a lot of the way that it would work in the U.S. would has to do with regulation of what corporation can or cannot do. That's actually what's much more popular with citizens, is to say you cannot do a car that's too polluting as opposed to put uh, prices. Economists tend to like prices better, but citizens like to like regulations better, and I think they're, they're, they're right in, in, this, in, in this instance, as in many. Um, so you take my 1% my taxation, or. Uh, you can also, instead of make it 1%, you can also link it to a properly done uh, uh, carbon um, valuation of uh, what the firm do. So, and, so that would imply another discussion we didn't have, but uh, calculating properly the social cost of carbon. But once we have a good measure of the, better measure of the social cost of carbon, which is significantly higher than we have now, that takes into account the mortality effect, etc., then you can try and say, well, this, this company is you know, much more polluting than another, and we are going to uh, tax them. Instead of taxing them 1%, we're going to tax them 2%. And then this other company is very virtuous, and they could be taxed less. So that would be a way of kind of acting directly on the corporation. Um, on the, the, I think you're absolutely right uh, on, on the use uh, uh, of, the, of the world and use of the, the the lower income country, and at the same time, it's hard to, to you know, to, to, to tell, to, to, to wait for, for, for them to bear the responsibility of the political action for a problem that is not even in their country. So, uh, I mean, it would be great if they, if they got involved, but I wouldn't say it's their job. Uh, it is really your job, or uh, well, our job here, to, uh, to do it, because, and unfortunately, it's our job, but ultimately, whether we do it or not, are not going to change our, our, our lives. It's going to change their lives. So the question is how to get the two together. Um, I, I didn't mention nuclear because uh, I'm not a, you know I'm not an engineer. I talked about I talk about economics. I think you know I don't think they are silver bullets. So I don't think nuclear is one of them. But that doesn't mean it's not part of the of the mix. But it's not really my uh, uh, my my line of trade. We are running, we have run out of time. So I, I would just say, if you could offer some last words of advice to the students out here as they are thinking about uh, their life in the future, um, what would you tell them? It gets, uh, it can get a little, uh, I mean, the key is really to not get overwhelmed. I think that the danger is to say, well, this is just, this is doomed, you know, it's just not going to work, there's nothing I can do. Uh, I think the key is to uh, find uh, a place where you can make progress at your, uh, you know, at whatever it is that, and it's going to be a combination of what's in your uh, uh, skill set, what is your passion, and what is in your intellectual neighborhood, which doesn't have to be a physical neighborhood because you could well move to another country to, to make it happen. And then if you make 
Hawkeye's there, then you'll have changed the world. And this is the, this is the way that it's going to happen. Is, you know, the way we say it in, in French from Voltaire is cultivate your garden. Uh, so that's, that's my, my, my one piece of advice, is that you don't change the world by thinking, I'm going to have to solve the whole problem, because then you, know, you might as well just get depressed. Just go and <laughs> change the world like one, one little bit at a time. And you know, looking back, at, you know, for example, Jepal is turning 20 this year. And looking back at what we have done in 20 years, you know, I feel pretty good. And if I look forward, I feel pretty scared. Because I think, oh, so this is kind of how you want to. Esther, thank you so much for inspiring all of thank us. Let's give a big round of applause.